Hey, Blake T. Wild here, and that is right. You did not misread the title. This comic that I'm about to present to you is the best, the greatest, if I will, Justice League storyline to ever go into publication and exist ever. And it's from Marvel Comics. But more importantly, it's from the writer that I hereby decree as the greatest that Marvel Comics has ever had. Mark Grunewald. But before we get started, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more comic-related material and content just like this. Mark Grunewald was someone who resoundingly got comics. He started reading around the age of six and remained so until he entered junior high around 12 to 13. It was then that his mother suggested he show his maturity. <laughs> before entering junior high by getting rid of his collection, which he did. He sold around 300 comic books that he had been collecting since late 50s, early 60s for a whopping two comics for five cents. God, imagine if I could, oh, if only I had a time machine, I'd grow back and buy those comics from, <laughs> from a 13 year old Mark Grunewald. But one year later, he was back in the habit and continued reading, albeit alone, because he says that none of his friends were into comics. You know, it's that age where you want to grow up, you want to be mature. And a little tangent is that there's a fantastic quote that I love by C.S. Lewis, which goes like this. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. And so Mark continued reading comics until he got to college where he eventually found more people that were more open about their hobby like him. And eventually he discovered the grandeur of comic conventions. In the late 70s, before he was hired by either Marvel or DC, Mark Grunewald was self-publishing his own fanzine titled Omniverse. Typically, fanzines featured anthology stories, correspondence between fans, uh, articles by fans, and just whatever certain medium or genre they were focusing on, it would more or less be stuff like that. You'd make pen pals, you would sell stuff to other people, you know, it was, it was chat rooms before chat rooms, it was uh, comic TikTok, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not hip. Here's a fun fact about fanzines, particularly those related to comics. The proto-Superman character first appeared in Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster's 1933 fanzine, Science Fiction. But Mark Grunewald, his fanzine was not like anything I just described. Omniverse was dedicated to continuity and the consistency between the 2D realities in which are held between 15 to 20 thin sheets of paper called comic books. He would later continue this in spirit when he was appointed as editor of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. Welcome to Omniverse. The publication in your hands is like no other. It is the first magazine ever to be devoted solely to the exploration of fictional reality in its many depictions in contemporary literature. The word omniverse is used in my treatise on reality in comic literature to refer to the continuum of all universes, the space-time matrix that comprises all alternate realms of reality. Omniverse will examine comic books not as an art form, nor as a literature. Omniverse will treat comics as a medium of ideas, presenting speculations on phenomena, science, metaphysics, the whole gamut of reality as is depicted in comics. 
Fictional reality is not a topic that a majority of comics and science fiction readers will be concerned with, for it deals with these literary forms not merely on the level of entertainment, but on the level of ideas. If you look for more in your comic, science fiction reading than a few minutes or hours of escapist pleasure, Omniverse is meant for you. And then he begins the issue with a discussion about Howard the Duck and funny animal cartoons. Also, Mark and his father, Myron Grunewald, co-wrote a, like, journal called A Primer of Reality in Comic Books in 1977. Mark had such an obsession with keeping record and track of continuity that he was nicknamed the Continuity Cop of Marvel. Uh, boy, that light is something. I'm the, uh caboose on this train of speakers, uh, so I'll keep it short and cover just what they left out. <laughs> no, actually I'm going to talk about uh, the Marvel Universe. This is what makes Marvel different from all the other companies that are doing comics or trying to do comics or whatever. The Marvel Universe, what it is, is the coolest sandbox ever invented. It's it's a sandbox. It's it's something that Stan created. He's the architect, and he lets all the rest of us play in it. Uh, some people have calculated that there are more stories set in the Marvel Universe in this common backdrop than in any other fictional reality ever devised by any human being. I think that uh, there are, at last count, between 5,000 and 7,500 different stories set in this same place. So what do I do? I was, I was called the, the continuity cop. Well, <clears throat> uh, I keep track of things. Uh, that's why I do this book called the Official Handbook of the Marvel Universe. It's, it's like our encyclopedia. It's our way of keeping track of things. I'm the guy who, uh, well, if Stan is the architect of this sandbox, uh, Tom DeFalco, the editor-in-chief who spoke earlier, he's like the supervisor, and I'm the custodian. I gotta sweep up all the messes and tell, oh, you, you can't uh, put your uh, sand there, and things like that. I, I'm the uh, custodian. What exactly I do is I keep track of what names are in use so that we don't get 13 destroyers. Right now we only have five. Uh, but we really only wanted one. Uh, what is real and what is not? Can we change what, what seems to have been established in the past or uh, can we preserve it? Frequently we will find that uh, discrepancies do creep in. I mean, we have, as I said, over a hundred different writers, uh, try as they might, they're not telepathic. Uh, no one has necessarily read everything, like I have, uh, and so they don't know what, what has uh, gone before, so if they don't know it, they're possibly doomed to negate it in some way, or at least uh, not pay any attention to it. And uh, our system of checks and balances is that I try to read most of the material as it goes out as the final continuity check. Uh, we have the word continuity to mean something different than you do in film. Uh, it's just the sense of continuing, a sense that the, the universe is uh, continuing to unfold in the same direction and it's not taking these weird non-continuous paths. I like to think of it as consistency more than continuity. So uh, what are some of the features of the Marvel Universe you may be asking yourself, especially if you haven't read them? Uh, I asked myself that too, and that's why I have all these notes, because I can't remember. Well, first, they share a lot of features that are the same as our real world, or at least what our consensus real world might be if we had a consensus. For example, it's the same year in the Marvel Universe as it is this year. This is not set in the past, not set in the future. It's, it's now. It has the same cities, states, and countries in common with the city, states, and countries that we have in our real world. Not the case before Marvel came along. Before they would have fictional cities like Gotham City and Metropolis and wherever. All of our, uh, or most of our places are the same as in the real world. Is that we are trying to keep a balance, a very precarious balance, between not letting just the, the sheer number and amount of these things burden the reality in such a way that it's not believable. Because we believe that we have the most credible, the most character-wise believable fictional universe that has ever been devised. It's not only the biggest, but it's the most believable. So let me tell you, it's a full-time job trying to keep these things in line and not letting them affect consumer technology, not letting them affect religion, not 
letting them uh, affect everything. The way we do it, in a nutshell, is every time people see something amazing, they're surprised. That's all it is. It's, it's we, we let the people think that everything they see that's way, way, way out of the ordinary is anomalous, is, is uh, wonderful. So it's, it's like even in New York, and let me tell you, New Yorkers are, are pretty jaded. Even in New York, every single time Spider-Man swings by, they're amazed. They never saw anything like that. I did not know a man could do that, they say. And, and that's, how, that's how we keep the level of relatability into our universe, which, as I said, is a big universe, possibly the biggest universe ever invented by man. And, and that's why we try to keep the reader relatability by making all of these things as wonderful as they really are and not letting them permeate uh, the universe in such a way that uh, it becomes old hat and everybody has a uh, teleporter in their closet and you know a, a closet full of unstable molecule clothing. You, you can tell I do, but most people don't. It hasn't, hasn't come down to consumer technology. Uh, I would say that the existence of the Marvel Universe with all of its interrelated characters and its fantastic yet consistent elements is probably the reason why Marvel Comics has become and will remain for the foreseeable future until we mess it up big time, uh, the top selling comic book company in the Western world. Walt Simonson in his Fantastic Four run made every member of the Time Variance Authority resemble Mark Grunewald, whom Owen Wilson also fairly resembles as Mobius in the show. Mark Grunewald was hired by Marvel Comics in 1978, and he would work there until his death 18 years later in 1996. He was initially hired as an assistant editor, and in 1982, he was promoted to editor where he took the reins of The Avengers, Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Spider-Woman, and the What If series. But that's not all he did. He was also a fill-in penciler of just various issues whenever they would need it, but he specifically wrote and penciled all four issues of the 1983 Hawkeye miniseries. But aside from being a fantastic editor and mentor to future creators of the comic industry, Mark Grunewald is perhaps most well known as a writer, specifically of the Captain America series. Uh, I had been doing symbolic characters, uh, characters, uh, villains that uh you know, don't just rob banks, but have some symbolic nature uh, to their actions. Flag Smasher, who represents anarchy and non-nationalism and uh, characters uh, of that ilk. And I realized that because Captain America was the good guy, mm -hmm. it seemed to be saying that patriotism had to be good because patriotism was Captain America and he was the good guy. And so I wanted to show the dark side of, of patriotism so I invented the character Super Patriot to show that, and he eventually became Captain America, because he's the Rambo version of, of Cap, also the, the more commercialized. He's, he's the American dream as most people think of it, which is, you know, come to America, make a lot of money, and, you know, at the expense of others, and, you know, you know do whatever it takes to get ahead, because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think that's their idea of the American dream, making money. And that's not uh, Steve Rogers' idea. Uh, he believes it's, you know, the uh, land of opportunity where you can be whatever you try to be, mm -hmm. you know, so he's the ultimate self-made man. He doesn't, if, if what you want to be is a big money maker, all right, that's one thing, but, you know, that's, that to me is the, the dark side of the American dream and of patriotism. Mark Grunewald still holds the record, I believe, as the longest writer on the series with 10 years on the title and 137 issues written. If Jack Kirby and Joe Simon were Captain America's parents, Mark Grunewald would be Captain America's cool uncle. Is this a silent picture or what? So far, no one's very funny today. Uh, if I could be funny, I wouldn't need to talk about it. Okay, this is what's known as musical chairs. Oh, no. Mr. Matt, you are here to be the crank up and the turn down kind of guy. Musical. Oh, These guys are going to walk the music suddenly cuts, then they will sit down as quickly as they can. But for some reason, there is one less chair than there are people. That means somebody here is a loser. <laughs> somebody has a big L written on their forehead already. More than somebody's a loser. 
and we want to see who it'll be. All right? Walk in a circle. Counterclockwise, like your brains. birthday party, Glenn. Ready to get Rob? Yeah. Uh, go. Hey, Glenn. I thought you were assistant. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, Glenn, when are we going to get married? Glenn, now you got to keep me in the loop. <laughs> Characters created by Mark during his time on Captain America include John Walker, aka US Agent, Battlestar, Crossbones, and Flag Smasher. 
Any of those sound familiar? Mark Grunewald continued his creative journey into comics throughout the 1980s and well into the 1990s, but his work would really culminate in his magnum opus released in 1985, a 12-issue maxi-series that follows a league, if you will, of diverse superheroes called the Squadron Supreme of America as they deal with a near-cataclysmic aftermath where the team decides that they themselves, the superheroes of this world, are the only option to rule it and keep everyone safe and in order. Sound familiar? Remember earlier when I said that a lot of his comics are from the early 60s? Guess which characters from a certain company were the highest sellers? But as an editor at Marvel, it was very unlikely that he would ever get the chance to actually write for the distinguished competition. And as Chris Robertson so eloquently put in an article he wrote on Mark Grunewald, In Squadron Supreme, he was given the opportunity to write the JLA, or near enough to count. But better still, he was able to write them in a way that DC Comics would never allow. He was allowed to change them, and more than that, allow them to change the world around them. And this wouldn't be the first or last time that Mark Grunewald has done something like this. Uh, later in the late 80s, early 90s, he would write for Quasar at Marvel, a total of 60 issues where he essentially became Marvel's Green Lantern, and Mark even wrote stories in which Quasar teamed up with Makari of the Eternals, essentially creating his very own Flash and Green Lantern comics. And in that aforementioned Hawkeye miniseries, he gave Hawkeye and the newly reinvigorated Bobby Morse, aka Mockingbird, the Green Arrow, Black Canary relationship dynamic. I could go on and on about Mark Grunewald and all the stories and information I have regarding him just for making this video of his exceptional skill in just understanding the essentials of pure storytelling, of his humor and witticism, of his killer mustache, and I could still venture down this path of nostalgia for, for a man that I never knew. Recounting old stories to you, revisiting old photographs and videos, pretending that he's still around, making comics and keeping track of Marvel's continuity. But what is funny, that's what I really want to talk about. You see, it is my belief that funniness or humor, as it is sometimes called, is simply a nervous response to the recognition that like this plastic skull, someday we're all going to die. You see, we keep death away for one instant more by laughing. <laughs> but I don't want you to take my word for it. Let's go to the man on the street or avenue as the case may be and see what he or she thinks what humor is all about. <laughs> oh, he's such a cutie. But I'm not. Because that's not why you came to this video, and that is not a healthy way to remember someone as artistic and great as Mark Grunewald. Mark Grunewald died of a heart attack at the age of 42 on August 12th, 1996. And after his death, he was cremated and his ashes were mixed with the ink used to print the first trade paperback of Squadron Supreme. I don't think Mark would want us to focus on his death, or even himself. He'd probably want us to focus on comics. He wanted to create a community of fun-loving comic readers who were all connected by their enjoyment of the medium, be it through monthly reading or extreme analysis. There are even stories of Mark at conventions with a, a camera recorder filming Marvel fans who would come up and getting them to recite comic panels as though they were singing opera. <laughs> so I'll end this section with a reading from one of Mark's editorial pieces, Mark's Remarks, from a comic in 1986. The point of all this? One, if you like comics, there's nothing wrong or immature about it especially these days with such a broad range of comics to choose from. 
If people tell you otherwise, they probably haven't actually read a comic in a long time. Two, if you're the only person in your neighborhood who likes comics, don't worry. There are ways to meet others who like them too, especially if your town has a comic specialty shop. And if you can't find anyone who reads them that lives near you, well, at least you'll have the fun I had knowing you're unique. And hey, look where my interest got me. A great job at the world's best comics company. Mark Grunewald. Built from, I suppose, Mark's infatuation with continuity and the timeline and ensuring that Really, I've said it before, Marvel maintains the whole, it's the world outside of your window. Squadron Supreme was a 12-issue maxi-series that played out in real time over the course of one year. Each issue covered one month of the squad's self-created time frame to fix every issue in the world within a year. And because of that, and because I want to be able to properly present this series because I adore it more than any other Marvel comic I've read. I am going to be covering this an issue at a time. Each month, I will cover another one until we finish the whole 12 issues out in one year. Hence, hence I declare from one year forth, we shall continue or we shall be there. I'm, I'm doing an issue a month. That's what I'm trying to get at here. So who are the Squadron Supreme? They were initially debuted as an obvious parody of the Justice League that Roy Thomas used to make fun of DC. They were called the Squadron Sinister, but Mark Grunewald later retconned this because he <laughs> thought it was dumb, I guess. And uh, he retconned that the Squadron Sinister, get this, were actually evil clones created by the Grand Master based on the Squadron Supreme of Earth-712, which is where our story today takes us. Okay, here's where it gets a little hectic, uh, so pay no mind if I keep glancing at my script. The Squadron Supreme later crossed over with both the Defenders and kind of the Micronauts when they fought a villain called Null, the Living Darkness, I believe is his full name. Uh, and a Fantastic Four villain called the Overmind. Uh, Overmind and Null teamed up, I suppose you could say, although it was more like Null just took over Overmind. And some stuff happened, they fought the Defenders, blah blah blah. Overmind and, uh, in essence, Null, because he was like possessing his body or his mind or whatever through other dimensional means, they get sent to Earth-712 where Overmind, under the influence of Null, took control of the U.S. President Kyle Richmond, the former Nighthawk superhero. But, but, they accidentally turned him into a vegetable. <laughs> but, a collection of telepaths called Chorus, who have created its very own mental abstraction of a corporeal being made its way to Earth-712 after they had fallen in love with Earth-616's Kyle Richmond, a.k.a. Nighthawk, who had died and, like, resurrected Earth-712's Kyle Richmond through various means, mainly filling in the gaps of his broken brain with Earth 616's Kyle's memories. Is this making any sense? Think of Jurassic Park. Pretend that the little mosquito in Amber and the DNA they get out of that, that's Squadron Supreme Nighthawk. And then the frog DNA that InGen uses, that's Earth 616 Nighthawk. And they just filled the gaps in there. So he's got memories from both fucking realities that's kind of messing him up a little bit. But that's fine. Because Overmind, still controlled by Null, created a bio-construct of Kyle Richmond to act as a puppet president for the country. And then the world! Because <laughs> it was turned into a totalitarian dictatorship. With mass arrests taking place, concentration camps were installed, re-education occurred, and Overmind 
just sort of left the world to its own devices as they kind of began constructing fleets of nuclear weapons and ships on the moon to begin conquering the rest of the galaxy and universe, I suppose. The squadron sands the almighty powerful Hyperion and the newly resurrected Nighthawk were all taken over and brainwashed and controlled by Null and Overmind, and they were a big reason why America took over the world. So that's where we're at now. Null and Overmind have conquered the world. Uh, Hyperion and Nighthawk go to Earth-616 to get the Defenders to help them. They were successful in overthrowing the Iron Grip that had been wrought across the entire globe, but the Empire of Null being destroyed caused a power vacuum to ensue, and that is where we find our heroes today. You'll see how bad it is. They make sure to tell you. Released in 1985, written by Mark Grunewald with pencils by Bob Hall, inks by John Beatty, and colors by Christy Scheel. This is Squadron Supreme. The Utopia Principle. The book begins at the edge of the stratosphere as Hyperion, with his awesome might, struggles with halting the crashing 347-ton squadron satellite base. Three and a half minutes later, he makes splashdown and is met by other members of the Squadron Supreme. Amphibian, Wizard, and Dr. Spectrum. Dr. Spectrum uses his power prism to create a sling with which they haul the satellite to shore. There it is. The finest man-made object ever put into the sky. The satellite headquarters of the Squadron Supreme. Ah, now a dilapidated husk. If only we had gotten through it a bit sooner. We might have been able to correct its decaying orbit. Maybe it was meant to come crashing down on our heads. Meanwhile in Niagara, Power Princess, Nuke, Arcana, and Captain Hawk continue their aerial survey of America. They come across civilians in the process of looting a crashed food ration truck. The heroes land and the crowd panics. Hawk tells them to drop the stolen food and return to their vehicles immediately when an elderly man steps forward from the crowd and exclaims that they haven't had decent meals in weeks. Not since the gangs from the cities have ventured out further and further and are raiding parties to farmlands and livestock ranches. The squadron are taken aback and Hawk tells them to just take what they need. But then bullets begin cracking the air. The squadron leaps into action. Arcana forms a protective spell around the civilians as Nuke and Power Princess make their way to the origin of the Hail of Fire. A military jeep speeds to a halt and explains that they've arrived to assist the ration truck against the looters. Power Princess orders them to stand down, but the troops open fire. Nuke uses his ability to generate nuclear energy to decay their weapons and vehicle. Power Princess stops him from going even further, and they all leave. Elsewhere, over the Midwestern states, the scientific genius and inventor Tom Thumb pilots Nighthawk, Golden Archer, and Lady Lark as they discuss how the hell they're going to fix America. Tom says that anything broken can always be fixed as they arrived at a fire at a deserted natural gas plant. The team disperses, Tom and Nighthawk heading off to shut down the gas storage tanks, while the Golden Archer and Lady Lark attempt to deal with the fire itself. They find a water tower, but it's no use, so Lark uses her hypersonic cry to signal Nighthawk and Tom that they need to get the hell out of there. They all narrowly escape the fire as Archer Calls Tom a midget repeatedly. <laughs> a few hours later in the mountain ranges of Northern Moorland. I should also point out before continuing that like DC Comics, uh, Earth-712 has a plethora of fake cities, states, and regions and countries that are brought up during this series. Uh, there's no map or anything that explains where these places are in relation to the real world or themselves, just that they exist. So in the mountain ranges of Northern Moorland, the squadron arrive at their temporary base, and later after everyone is situated, they begin their emergency meeting. The heroes note that the world they once protected is in utter shambles, and it's their fault. Nuke argues that they had nothing to do with it since they were controlled by the Overmind, but Wizard points out that to the people, especially the American people, it doesn't matter what strange tale they tell of an alternate universe mind-controlling alien villain. They still failed to protect the world. Kyle then says that the situation is their fault, especially his. Arcana and Nuke point out that they did stop Overmind, and Nuke says that they won like they always do, even if it did take a little while. Whatever we do, it's going to be tricky. The squadron's lost a lot of credibility by becoming the government's super militia. 
the United States government, the American system, myself as a president, how can we say it was all a mistake? That we were under some alien's control and expect them to believe us or forgive us? We can't. Defeatist talk will get us nowhere, Kyle. It is deeds, not words, that will restore our credibility and save the world in the process. Power Princess then goes on to explain that on the small island that she hails from, Utopia Isle, and the Utopians, which I love this little detail, are a result of genetic experimentation of early humans by the Kree. So they're essentially inhumans of this universe. There's not a lot of stuff like this in the comic series, like like references to the real uh, 616 universe. You know, there's... Um, there's like great res power comes great responsibility that Hyperion says later. There's this uh, note of the Kree. But it's just these little breadcrumbs here and there that just to remind you, yeah, it's still the Marvel Universe. It's just a very different version of it. And I just really love it. Anyway, the people of Utopia Isle had no poverty, injustice, discrimination, or crime. But when the atomic bomb was harnessed and used in World War II, Utopia constructed itself a spacecraft and left Earth leaving Zarda, the Power Princess, behind to act as their sole emissary. She says that the ideals of Utopia Isle is what they must strive towards now. A new society, a brave new world unlike the previous one which failed. Perhaps you have something there, Zarda. My parents instilled in me the moral code and values I live by. One of the things they taught me is that it is wrong to use my power to interfere too far into mankind. But maybe they were wrong. If I choose to prevent one accident, don't you think I was aware of all the others I wasn't preventing? I still had the power to choose which lives to save and which ones not. I could have done far more. Well, this curbing of power policy hasn't worked. Maybe this crisis could have been avoided if we had all been living up to our potential. With great powers such as ours come equally great responsibilities. We've never truly faced up to that fact. I propose we dedicate ourselves to remaking the world as Zarda said, a utopia. We should not just randomly stop super criminals, an alien invader, or a natural disaster and leave the rest of the world's problems unaddressed. Problems which inflict the majority of mankind with suffering and death. We should actively pursue solutions to all the world's problems. Abolish war and crime, eliminate poverty and hunger, establish equality among all peoples, clean the environment, cure diseases, and even cure death itself. Here, here. Right on. Just a moment, Hyperion. We've known each other for a long time. I've fought to make the world a better place, too. But solving all the world's problems and handing it to people on a silver platter just seems... wrong. How meaningful will a utopia be if it's a gift and not something that has been earned by mankind's own labors? And what if they don't accept it? Will you force them to take it? If there's a way to save countless lives who would have been lost to all of these afflictions and and we don't try to implement it what kind of heroes would we be i'm not certain about this utopia plan either if something goes wrong couldn't we leave the world in a worse shape than it is now frankly lark i don't see how the world could ever be as bad off as it is now well how about we put it up to a vote <sighs> the fate of the world decided by a vote among the powerful elite Fine. But before we vote, let me just say one thing. To institute a utopia, we will have to take control of the world. And to the average person out there, is that any different than what the Overmind tried to do? In either case, there is no free will. Come on, blokes, we can debate philosophy until the heavens burn down. Let's vote. All in favor of Hyperion, raise your bleeding hands. Ten in favor, two oppose. Do you take bow to the mandate of the majority? Yes, though I still have my reservations. I'm sorry. 
I'll have to accept my resignation. Kyle, wait! I respect your views, even if I don't agree with them, but please remain on with us just a little while longer. Help us work out the transition. As president, you could. I am sorry, but you do as you must, and I will do as I must. Dr. Spectrum then suggests that they present a new image of themselves to the public. He suggests that they go on television and unmask to announce their plans. Hyperion agrees with this and instructs everyone to return to their loved ones and family and friends and give them an advanced warning of what they plan to do. Then they all set off into the night. This episode is brought to you by My Comics, specifically the Custodians Agents of Cross, which I am serializing over on my Patreon, patreon.com slash videos. It's over 60 pages of pure comics for only $15, but you can see it serialized weekly over on my Patreon for as little as $2. It is a love letter to the Silver Age filled with fun characters, crazy stories, and even fake advertisements. I'm also serializing each issue of Destructo Boy, a fun sci-fi zany epic that is fit for the whole family and follows a little robot on a giant space station as he battles crime, villainy, and giant monsters and whatever threats should arise to his home. Each weekly serialized post includes commentary and annotations on the comic. I am also posting commentary tracks for the MCU, the Snyderverse, and any movies in general over at Pop Pop Popcorn which I will be posting a audio commentary track of any movie and a follow-up discussion video. There's also behind-the-scenes progress posts of The Custodians as I'm working on it, original art, and much more. Later, in Cosmopolis, New Troy, <laughs> the entire city is experiencing a blackout for the third day in a row. Hyperion flies to the apartment of his girlfriend, Lonnie Latimer, who accidentally shoots him. She realizes it's him and runs up and asks, what the hell is happening? Then Hyperion unmasks to reveal that he is actually mild-mannered Mark Milton. He informs her of the squadron's plans and that because he is an alien, they are genetically impossible to mate. <laughs> and he's like, I'm sorry if I was leading you on, but it's not going to happen. I know you wanted to have kids, but I'm not the guy. And she gets very angry and asks him to leave. Speeding to the suburbs of Mechanopolis, the wizard arrives at his home and heads down to the basement where he opens the panic room and finds his wife, Madeline, and their child. In Atomic City Herculania, Dr. Spectrum flies to his trailer, cracks open a beer with the light spectrum, and phones up a booty call. In Mayflower Fredonia, Captain Hawk arrives to find his mother alone in their manor. And he learns that his father, the former hero called American Eagle, died a week ago when they were unable to get his heart medication. In Capital City, Magellanland, Zarda returns to her apartment where she finds her husband, Howard Shelton. They've been together for 40 years, ever since she rescued him from his sinking ship. 30 miles off the coast of Kirkgard, Amphibian meets up with some dolphin friends of his, and they just, they like gossip and complain about the land world. <laughs> In Franklin Town, New Babylon, Lady Lark and Golden Archer return to their apartment but discover it has been trashed and looted. Archer finds a dead body lying against their sofa, but he keeps that discovery to himself. In Motor City, Wyandotta, Nuke, aka Albert Gaines, arrives at the hospital where his parents reside due to their terminal cancer. Albert nearly tells them that he's actually the superhero called Nuke and member of the Squadron Supreme, but he holds back not wanting to drop a bomb like that in their condition. He then hugs them and tells them that nothing's really happening in the world. And then his mother says that he should visit his little brother while he's in town. In Pomershan, New Troy, Arcana arrives at a clearing in the middle of the forest. She opens a magical doorway and inside finds her husband and three children and their talking cat. 25 miles northeast of Maglo, Moreland, Tom Thumb arrives at the satellite base. He silently flies inside hoping that who he's looking for is safe. Eventually, he gets the power restored and activates the satellite's primary computer. Ada! That's right! Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fans rejoice! <laughs> this is the origin of Ada! If you've watched Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you'll recognize her as being played by Mallory Jansen, one of the best villains of one of the best Marvel shows, originated in one of Marvel's best comics. Is it really that surprising? I would also like to point out that I have covered the comic origins of the creator of the MCU, Ada, 
uh, Holden Radcliffe's Origin in Machine Teen. Check that one out. It's a fun video. And finally, in a tunnel beneath the streets of Cosmopolis, New Troy, Nighthawk drives his car into his home's subterranean base and makes his way into his mansion. And then he watches the protesters outside the fences for a few minutes before he phones his presidential aide and informs him that he plans on making a televised address to the nation. Then he changes into a new costume and begins planning the speech when Hyperion knocks on the window. He climbs inside and says that he wants to talk. Just the two of them. Hyperion tells Nighthawk of the squadron's plans and suggests that they make a joint address. He tells Kyle that if it wasn't for Overmind, he would have easily gone down in history as the greatest president since, since Lincoln. And desperately tries to get Kyle to change his mind regarding the matter. But Nighthawk won't have it. Hyperion tells Kyle that he's still his friend. And if Kyle ever needs to talk or wants to talk to him for any reason to just reach out. And as he does so, he attempts to put a hand on his friend's shoulder, but Kyle walks away silently, and Hyperion soars back into the night sky. Lincoln, great emancipator. <laughs> if the squadron seeks to enslave the people of the world for their utopia program, maybe the world will need a new emancipator. I'll bet Hyperion has forgotten all about this room. Argonite, the one radioactive isotope that Hyperion isn't immune to. Thumb hoped to discover why it was so lethal to Hyperion and find a way to immunize him. Never succeeded. I've got a different use for it. Without Hyperion, the squadron would not have the raw power to bring about the Utopia program. A single bullet made of Argonite would be enough to kill him. But, God, do I have the guts to kill my best friend in order to keep the world free? <sighs> it shouldn't take long to carve the bullet. My fellow Americans and peoples of the world, it is with a heavy heart that I come before you. The regrettable situation in the world today is at least in part my fault, as well as the fault of those government, military, and industrial leaders who are my aides. No explanation I can offer could ever possibly justify or condone the loss of life and disruption of world peace that recent foreign and domestic policies initiated by this administration have caused. In light of this, I have asked for the resignations of my entire cabinet. I have discharged all high-ranking Pentagon personnel. I will make public the names of all congressmen who have supported my policies. And lastly, I hereby resign as President of the United States of America. I profoundly regret what has happened, and I only hope that the next administration can undo the damage caused by this administration. I now turn you over to Hyperion of the Squadron Supreme. Thank you, Mr. President. Citizens of America and all nations, do not panic. We, the Squadron Supreme of America, hereby assume supreme authority in all matters pertaining to world security and survival for the duration of this critical transition back to peacetime. Although the squadron itself was duped into participating in some of the activities initiated by the current administration, we were instrumental in bringing the government to its senses. You may recall that I myself was labeled a traitor by the current administration for refusing to support its policies. But that is all behind us now. What is ahead is the difficult task of reconstructing our society, our world, to what it was before. But we cannot stop there. We must prevent a situation like the one we were in from ever happening again. In exchange for your utmost cooperation and support, we, the Squadron Supreme, hereby vow to you to solve all the problems known to men and women of all nations, not just brought on in recent days, but those known to mankind since time immemorial. 
We vow to eliminate hunger, poverty, war, crime, disease, pollution, and oppression within one year from tonight. If we cannot do so in that time period, we will voluntarily give up any and all authority hereby invested in us. We are the world's best hope. As a gesture of the openness and sincerity by which we take this pledge to you, we would like to shed our masks. And it is with this act, I hope you will all join us in ushering in a new age of trust and friendship and unity for all the Earth. I hope you enjoyed this episode of What Is. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. As always, let me know if you have any suggestions for comics that I should be covering. Um, what are your thoughts on this comic? Like I've said and made clearly evident, this is my favorite Marvel comic that has ever been released. Uh, Mark Grunewald is fantastic. It's just... This story, these 12 issues... You'll look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, it's just Marvel ripping off DC with Justice League. No. they. What is about to come is so much better than anything you'll ever read from DC. Or Marvel! <laughs> um, just so much is said in these 12 issues. And they're kind of, they're a little bit oversized, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I've read them all. But they're larger than normal comic issues. And there's just so much going on. There's so many crazy characters that are later introduced. Uh, just ideas. The next comic, they fight Kang. But he's not regular Kang. He's another version of Kang. He's a Scarlet Centurion, and that's crazy. Uh, oh, my God. There's And just going back and reading this, there's little hints and somewhat like foreshadowing going on. Uh, I, I don't want to spoil it, but, you know, <laughs> I want to talk about it. I'll just say a couple things. There is the fact that Hi uh, Tom Thumb wanted to create a cure for Hyperion's Argonite uh, weakness. And Golden Archer refusing to tell Lady Lark about the body that he found. Ooh, what could that mean? <laughs> what what secrets do I hold within this mind and these comic books? This It's the perfect in beginning. It just gets right into it. You just go straight in. When I first read this, I had no fucking idea about Overmind and Null from the Micronauts and the Defenders coming over and all that. It's It does an expert job just recounting where this universe has gotten to at this point and i i adore these characters i think they're fantastic um i like them better than the D the justice league <laughs> because like that article i quoted earlier said mark grunwald he doesn't have to worry ironically enough he doesn't have to worry about continuity if he was doing this for dc it would not be this good it would not be this well written it would not have these kind of stakes that are brought up and grow over the course of these 12 issues. It would just not be as good. And I would like to point out, this is 1985 that this is coming out. Watchmen's not till 86. Kingdom Comes way in the 90s. Injustice is way after that. This is the progenitor of that idea. And it's based off of what was original. I'm funny enough, kind of similar to Watchmen. It's based off of silly old comic characters. <laughs> like, you know, Watchmen was originally the Charlton. What if the Charlton comics, like, were serious or whatever? This is, what if I take this dumb Justice League parody that Roy Thomas concocted and I actually do something interesting with it? Oh, I cannot wait. I can't wait to show you more and discuss it issue after issue. Join me next month. Because we're going to be seeing issue two, and it's it, it, it starts up quick. It, once it starts rolling, it's going. 
<laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> But uh, as always, check out my Etsy and Patreon, patreon.com slash smokiesvideos, blaketwild.etsy.com. I should be getting reprints of the Custodians Agents of Cross in. This is a over 50 page, this is over 60 pages of comics goodness, a love letter to the 60s era of comics. It even comes with fake advertisements littered throughout the book. Uh, currently, you can read nearly the entire first issue for as little as $2 over on my uh, Patreon, where I've been serializing the pages each week with my commentary and annotations. The same goes for Destructo Boy. Oh, if I can grab him. Destructo Boy, issues one through five. This is the complete series, ladies and gentlemen. I'm doing a terrible job grabbing these things. All right here. You can purchase, pick them up all on my Etsy shop, or again, Lil's $2, you can get serialized releases of all Destructo Boy. So check that out. It really helps me out. It really supports me. I will hopefully be getting um, posters set up on my Etsy shop as well, so stay tuned for those. I'll probably make an announcement of which ones I decide to uh, uh, spring up on there. But yeah, let me know again what you thought of this video, Mark Grunewald, Bob Hall's art, um, what else, uh, this Squadron Supreme in general, have you ever heard of the Squadron Supreme before this, probably not, although you might have, I think they did something with them, with like the past year or two, I remember there was a Squadron Supreme thing that I didn't really care for, so I didn't read it, <laughs> And to end this video out, here is a montage of Mark Grunewald's life that was created by Tom Brevoort, who was a huge source of all the videos and photos and information that you saw at the beginning of this video. He has a whole website that you can find. You can find all my sources in the description, but Tom Brevoort had some great stuff. He posted an hour and a half long video of the Marvel offices Halloween party. That's what that video was earlier. And you can watch all of that. You can, it's a perfect time capsule to 1991. I think it is. It's all on his YouTube channel. Check out the description if you, to give him, you know, support on there as well. But I just love this video that he created of Mark Grunewald and what a better way to end a video celebrating Mark Grunewald and his life and his achievements and creations than this. I will see you next time. Bye. I've got time to think about the beauty of a thousand variations Of the beating of a wing of a hummingbird suspended in the aspect of the world Moving slower than molasses as I'm off to catch the girl Who is falling off the bridge and I'm there before she knows it I'll be gone before she sees me Got my hand around her waist, I pull it back to safety By the time she knows what's happened, there'll be someone else who needs me Time keeps dragging on and on and on and on. Time keeps dragging on. Time keeps dragging on. I've got time to think about my past as I dodge between the bullets. And my life was so exciting. Before I got this way And how long ago it was Now I never can explain By the clock that's on the tower Or the one that's in my brain And I'm there before you know it I'll be gone before you see me And I'd like to get to know you But you're talking much too slowly And I know you want to thank me But I never stick around Cause time keeps dragging on And on And on
wish I'd never gone into my lab to experiment that night before lightning flashed around me and time changed speed. Now I gotta try to be so patient until calamity will strike. Because when things change in an instant, it's almost fast enough for me. And I'll be there before you know it. I'll be gone before you see me. And do you think you can imagine anything so lonely? And I know you'd really like me, but I never stick around. Cause time keeps dragging on and on.